Okay, hello and welcome to today's presentation. This is Nathan Dennis, Associate Director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Before we get started, I want to share that this event includes live American Sign Language and captions. You should see our sign language interpreter, Antonio, on the other screen, and Karen O'Hara is providing live captions. A big thank you to the Peel Center for making ASL and captions available for today's program. And another big thank you to this year's uh, Doors Open Baltimore uh, sponsors and BAF supporters. We really appreciate um, your donations to making programs like this uh, available for free each year. Uh, and now just a few announcements. Uh, tomorrow we'll be joined by Mike French for a presentation on Baltimore's vernacular churches. On October 20th, uh, we'll be uh, looking at the history of Utah Farm um, a really interesting presentation. And on October 21st, we have a book talk about a history lover's guide to Baltimore with authors Brennan Jensen and Tom Chalky. And then October 22nd, we'll be joined by uh, an architect who is currently working on renovating the Holly Hutzler uh, mansion. Um, and now uh, getting toward, toward to today's presentation, I'd like to give an introduction to uh, David London and Nancy Crocter. Um, David London is curator, storyteller, magician, and producer based in Baltimore, who has spent over 15 years creating theatrical and interactive experiences designed to spark the imagination and inspire new ways to see and engage the world around us. After discovering that he was a magician at seven years old, um, he had spent over 20 years utilizing magic to tell stories and explore ideas. He has created 10 theatrical magic productions and regularly presents talks and workshops on both magic and the show business across the country. In the last several years, David has shifted his energies to using his unique form of storytelling to illuminate history. Recently, he has served as guest curator at the Jewish Museum of Maryland for Inescapable, The Life and Legacy of Harry Houdini, and also created Humbug, the great P.T. Barnum seance and traveling museum, both of which are now touring the country. Uh, Nancy Proctor is Chief Strategy Officer and Founding Executive Director of The Peel. From 2012 to 2020, Nancy was also co-chair of the International Muse Web, formerly Museums in the Web, conferences, and edited its annual proceedings. Previously, she served as Deputy Director of Digital Experience and Communications at the Baltimore Museum of Art a head of mobile strategy and initiatives at the Smithsonian Institution, and head of new media initiatives at the Smithsonian's American, media, American Art Museum. With a PhD in American art history and a background in filmmaking, curation and feminist theory and criticism in the arts, Nancy lectures and publishes widely on technology and innovation in museums, in French and Italian, and in English. And if you have questions during this presentation, you can add them to the Q&A box. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you so much, Nathan, and thank you for having us here today. If you want to switch to my video screen, that would be great. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, along with uh, having questions that you can type into the chat, if you have any technical or accessibility needs, feel free to type that in the chat as well, and we will help you out. Today's presentation is going to be split into two parts. Um, I'll begin by giving you a brief history and overview of the uh, Peel building, and then we'll welcome Nancy Proctor, who you just heard uh, wonderfully introduced, who will come in and give you some uh, updates on the amazing renovation that is underway at the Peel. And following that, we will open it up for questions, which we will encourage you to type uh, into the chat um, as we proceed. But particularly at the end, comments are welcome as well. We would like to begin this event by acknowledging with humility that the lands where Baltimore is situated today is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock indigenous peoples. The vast coastal area today known as Baltimore City, Maryland, sustained indigenous peoples until the arrival of Europeans beginning in the 1600s. Over the next 400 years, many Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock communities were decimated, absorbed by larger villages or tribes, and or forced by the U.S. federal government to move west beyond the Mississippi River with larger tribes. Since then, other tribal peoples have moved here in diaspora, including Lumbee peoples. 
On January 9th, 2012, two tribes of Piscataway, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe and the Piscataway Indian Nation, became the first tribes recognized by the state of Maryland. In 2017, the state also recognized the Akahanic Indian tribe. We acknowledge that Baltimore stands on stolen land. We would also like to acknowledge that this history was adapted from an original text authored by Ryan A. Coons, Peter Dayton, and Ashley Minner of the Lumbee tribe, and offer them our thanks for this contribution. We're going to do a little technology change here. Nathan, if you could um, bring up my other... Perfect. Now I'll bring this over here. All right, welcome everyone. Um, I hope that you are able to hear me okay, and we will um, begin with our presentation. Uh, this image here that you are looking at was from the 1822 Poppleton map of Baltimore, and you'll see that we have this beautiful illustration of the Peel Museum as it looked at that time, a museum and gallery of fine arts in on Holiday Street established by Rembrandt Peel with the wrong date, it says 1813, it was actually uh, 1814, but we will get to that in just a moment. And since I mentioned Holiday uh, Street here, to begin our tour, I would like to uh, take us out to what is a current view of Holiday Street, which you will see coming up here on the screen. Down on the left, you will see City Hall as it stands today, and we will be talking much more about City Hall as the program progresses. In a moment, I'm going to step through the doors of the Peel Museum, much as you would see it if you walked into the doors today, as I mentioned, and as you will hear, here we are outside just a few years ago. But as we step inside, uh, as we are looking today, the Peel is deeply under renovation. But aside from being the chief experience officer at the Peel, I also happen to be one of our in-house certified time travel agents. And so for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to uh, travel through time, first traveling back just a few years ago when the Peel uh, was up and running just before its renovation. And now that we are here, we will travel back in time throughout its 207 year history. This TV screen over here displays a installation that was created by UMBC known as Early Baltimore. It created a and recreated what Baltimore looked like around the year 1815. As you can see, it was a very uh, sparse at the time, uh, very few buildings across the street or next to the Peel Museum itself, much different than the city looks today. And uh, if you want to visit this map, which is interactive, and highly recommended, you can do so at earlybaltimore.org. It was in 1814 that uh, Rembrandt Peel, who you will see in just a moment over here on the uh, right side of the screen, decided to open his museum in uh, Baltimore. Apologies, he's on the left side of the screen. Baltimore was a thriving and bustling city at the time. And Rembrandt opened this museum, which is the very first purpose-built museum in America. Now, we say it was the first purpose-built museum because Rembrandt's father, Charles Wilson Peel, who in just a moment you will see peering out from behind the uh, doorway here, and we will take a look at that painting in just a moment, opened the first museum in America at the end of the 18th century. However, it occupied a pre-existing building, which is why we get to claim the Peel as the very first purpose-built museum in America. As I pan over to the left, we have a portrait painted by Rembrandt Peel, and this portrait is of Robert Carey Long Sr., who was the architect of the Peel Museum building. As I mentioned, this portrait was painted by Rembrandt Peel, and coming up on your screen now is another portrait of Robert Carey Long Sr., painted by Rembrandt's brother, Raphael Peel. Um, you will notice, uh, here's the portrait by Raphael Peel, 
You uh, may notice the name Robert Carey Long Sr. if you are familiar with Baltimore architecture, which I presume many of you are joining us here today. Robert uh, Carey Long Sr. Uh, built many buildings, uh, only a few of which still remain today, including this one, which is Davish Hall at the University of Maryland, as well as a uh, former incarnation of St. Paul's Church. Some of the original uh, building does remain, but it was uh, renovated and adopted at a a uh, later date. We're going to spin around now and enter into what was known in the previous incarnation of the Peel Museum as the Peel uh, Gallery, and we're going to take a look at that portrait that has been peering at us from behind the door. And this uh, portrait, as I mentioned, is of Rembrandt's father named Charles Wilson. Peel. The Peel family are considered to be the first family of American painters, and this self-portrait by Charles Wilson Peel was painted in 1822 in his 81st year of life, and it is called The Artist in the Museum. You will notice this very dramatic and theatrical view that he is presenting, pulling back this red curtain and revealing a variety of artifacts and specimens. To the left are natural history specimens, taxidermied animals, a taxidermy turkey by his right foot, his tools of painting, paintbrush and paint palette, and behind the curtain is the skeleton of the great mastodon. And we're going to talk about the mastodon in just a moment as we spin around in this room and look at this uh, beautiful painting painted by, in, uh, by Charles Wilson Peel, known as the excavation of the mastodon. We'll be spinning around in just a second, but since I have a lot to say, I'm going to keep talking here. Uh, but you can take one last glimpse at the artist in his museum. Here we go, spinning around, and directly above the fireplace is the painting that I just mentioned, The Excavation of the Mastodon. It was in 1801 that the Peel family got word of some uh, giant uh, bones that were discovered at Barber Farm in upstate New York, and after a fierce competitive funding battle against Thomas Jefferson himself, they exhumed what ended up being two skeletons and the first fully articulated prehistoric skeleton. This was a major turning point uh, in uh, natural history as the idea of extinction was less than 50 years old at this point and sort of upended uh, uh, humans' understanding of where they came from and what the world was like prior to their arrival. Now, in just the few paintings we've seen and this little story about their interest in natural history, you're probably starting to get a sense that the Peel family had uh, several different loves which were embodied in all of their museums. Not only their love of portrait painting, which was their bread and butter, but also a love of the natural history world. You may have also noticed some of the names I've been tossing out when talking about the Peel family uh, members, Rembrandt Peel, Rubens Peel, Raphael Peel, later Titian Ramsey Peel, Charles Wilson Peel instilled this love of natural history and painting in his children by naming them uh, after famous painters of the past and later uh, after uh, various uh, explorers and natural historians. Titian Ramsey Peel, uh, Rembrandt's younger brother, showed a particular penchant for the uh, natural world, and he used his painterly abilities to go on several expeditions where he both illustrated as well as collected a variety of natural history specimens. And you see a variety of uh, books on the Peel family, including Titian Ramsey's uh, book sitting on the table directly in front of you. I'm gonna jump over to the left corner of this screen here where we see a variety of silhouettes on the table. And I've pulled up here a silhouette cutting of uh, Moses Williams. And Moses Williams uh, was the son of parents who were enslaved to Charles Wilson Peel. And when uh, his parents became emancipated, Pennsylvania law at the time uh, said that any freed slave under the age of 28 became the responsibility of the enslaver. And so um, Moses Williams became uh, indentured to Charles Wilson Peel, although he was emancipated one year prior to when he was legally supposed to be at the age of 27. 
Whereas Charles Wilson Peale taught all of his children to be portrait painters, he taught Moses Williams to run the physiognotrace, which was a silhouette cutting machine, which Moses would then come in with scissors and turn into beautiful silhouette cuttings. And they would charge a slight extra fee at the museum if you wanted your silhouette cut. Now, since we've been talking about portrait painting and silhouette cuttings, it's important to remember that at the beginning of the 19th century, there was no photography yet. And so if you wanted your portrait captured for yourself or for future generations, the only way to do so would be to hire a portrait painter like the members of the Peel family or to have your silhouette cut like Moses Williams was able to provide for a nominal fee at the Peel Museum. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about Moses Williams later once Nancy takes over over the presentation and talks about our renovation and future of the Peel. We're going to um, turn here in just a moment and we are going to uh, look at the other side of the Peel Gallery, which is the part of this exhibition that was dedicated to the incredible gas light history of the Peel. While Rembrandt Peel was um, was uh, opening his museum, uh, he caught wind along with his brother Rubens in Philadelphia of a new technology that was sweeping Europe known as gas light technology. Uh, there were already gas street lights installed in England starting in 1807, um, but there were some difficulties with the technology, one being the incredibly horrible smell with it. <coughs> Excuse me. And so Rubens and uh, Rembrandt uh, started to talk to a variety of experts and they ended up inventing a, a new method to generate coal gas. They were generating coal gas in the backyard of the Peel. They would bring it into the museum in these cylinders that you see to the right of the image here. And they would display um, this gas by uh, feeding it through pipes and igniting it in their invention, which they called the magic ring of fire. These rings of fire were placed throughout the building, creating the idea of a nighttime attraction, a place you could visit at night. They expected this would attract nighttime visitors to the museum, and uh, indeed it did. But as you will see in this next picture that is coming up over here, many of them did not pay to enter the museum as their intention had been, but rather stood out on Holiday Street, simply gawking up at the brightest artificial light they had ever seen. Now, because of this invention, Rembrandt was able to get a contract with the city of Baltimore. Uh, this is actually an advertisement that he took out in the early days. Gaslight Peel's Baltimore Museum will be illuminated this evening. Now, as I was saying, because of these innovations, Rembrandt was able to get a contract with the city of Baltimore and, to, and he uh, secured a contract to install the very first gas street lights in Baltimore, which happened to be the very first gas street lights in America. He founded a company in the uh, Peel Museum in 1815 known as the Baltimore Gas Light Company, which has grown up today to become the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. So I always like to tell people if you live in in Baltimore and uh, you receive a bill from BG and E. When you do so, you can think of us, but we ask that you please smile when you do so. We still have uh, several functioning uh, gas lights in the uh, Peel uh, building and in the uh, Peel garden, which we will show you as we continue the tour. We have 19th century gas lights that work in the garden as well as 20th century gas lights along the front of the building. Now, since this slide has been up for a moment, you may have noticed that uh, this is labeled City Hall, which might uh, pique some eyebrows mm -hmm. if you are not familiar with the history. You see, Rembrandt believed that the museum should be... Um, uh, or Charles Wilson Peel, apologies, believed that museums should be publicly funded, whereas Rembrandt Peel believed that museums should be run like a business. But after only 15 years of operation, Rembrandt was unable to pay back for the, the investors who funded his museum, and they had to move the entire collection uh, up the street to a rented location, at which point our building was sold to the city of Baltimore. And in 1830, the Peel Museum building became Baltimore's very first city hall. It would serve as Baltimore's very first city hall for 45 years until 1875. This is a old uh, historic illustration of the building at the time and coming up is a uh, recently discovered photograph, um, which we believe was from the time that the building was uh, city hall as well. So this was a new and exciting discovery.
Over here in the other side of the room, you will see that there are some school desks and slates on the wall because after the new city hall was built just down the street on Holiday Street, which I uh, showed you at the beginning of the tour, the uh, building became from 1878 to 1889 male and female colored school number one, which was the very first school in the state of Maryland to offer a secondary uh, school education to students of color. Now, this was transformative in the educational landscape for if you wanted to be a teacher, you needed to have a high school diploma. But prior to the school that started in the Peel, there was no way for people of color to receive a high school diploma. And um, I've got coming up here a, a few other images. One is the uh, formation document to uh, start the colored school system in Baltimore, which will be popping up here in just a second. And after that, uh, this is a uh, photo of the front of the building, which was believed to be taken during the uh, uh, colored school time. And the last image that we will see here is a diploma from one Miss uh, Mamie Neal, who did not graduate uh, from the Peel, but did start her education uh, uh, in the Peel building and later went on to uh, graduate and become a educator herself. Here's the ordination, uh, ordinance for the establishment of the Colored High School in Baltimore City. And here is Mamie Neal's diploma, which um, we were fortunate to be able to have uh, scanned on loan from the uh, Great Blacks in Wax Museum. After the school shut down as colored school number one in 1889, the uh, building for about a 10 year period became the um, Baltimore City Water Works Department. Uh, it served as such for uh, just a short amount of time. Uh, here's a picture from around uh, 1900. This was from a newspaper article where uh, the city wanted to tear the building down, but instead they decided to rent it out to a bunch of private industry. And so what we uh, see here is uh, uh, the Peel building being used for the Stein Pipe Organ Company and the NH Lane Advertising Sign Company. And when these folks were in the building, they nearly destroyed it, and I believe Coming up here, you have a picture of the uh, building in its most, probably its most destroyed state that it ever was, which was after this industrial um, period. But a group of concerned citizens came together and convinced the city to bring the building back to life. And in 1931, the building reopened as a museum as the Municipal Museum of Baltimore. And here we're going to see some photos from the uh, next 65 years or so. It was architect John Scharf, who was the secretary of the Municipal Museum, who was in charge of the restoration. And the museum operated as the Municipal Museum of Baltimore all the way until 1997. The final exhibition at the museum was Mermaids, Mummies, and Mastodons, which if you have not, here you go, here's a picture of the catalog for that exhibition, which is available from the Peel Gift Shop if you are interested. It's a fascinating exploration of the emergence of American museums. Nancy will fill you in from the history from 1997 up to present day, but before I hand it over to her, I wanted to take you out into the incredible Garden of the Peel. So here we are, we'll just zoom around here for just a moment. And you can uh, see that this is a hidden gem in the heart of downtown Baltimore. You're going to see here for uh, several slides, various images that the uh, garden has uh, taken on. Here it was prior to the 1931 renovation before there was even a lot there. It was just the back of the building. And coming up next, you will uh, see how the uh, garden has progressed over time. Here it was uh, prior to um, the new organization taking over in the uh, mid um, 2010s. Uh, it had become rather grown over at the point. But as you look at this image, I want you to particularly uh, notice this architectural pediment uh, in uh, the back of the garden. This uh, pediment was originally uh, installed on this building here, which was First Union Bank, uh, also constructed by uh, our architect Robert Carey Long Sr. But it was being torn down at the time that the Peel went through its first renovation in 1930. And so the architects on the new project at the time decided to salvage this pediment and bring it back into the Peel Garden. 
It is believed that this uh, pediment is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, architectural sculpture uh, remaining in America. It was uh, created by Italian sculptors Andre and Franzoni, who were brought over by uh, Latrobe to work on the U.S. Capitol in Washington, which uh, was later burned to the ground. But during their time when they were not working on the Capitol or projects in D.C., they were... Uh, traveling to Baltimore to work on several projects here. This is a 3D scan of that uh, pediment that was done by our friends at Direct Dimensions. And if you are interested in exploring this scan further um, at the end of the presentation today, we will direct you to our website where a variety of 3D scans uh, created by Direct Dimensions will be available to you. So that was our very rapid fire history of the uh, Peel Museum building itself. Uh, but now it is my pleasure to hand over to uh, Nancy Proctor, who will take you into the current renovations of the Peel and the progress we are making on the building. Nancy, you may be muted. Of course, there has to be, that can't be a Zoom presentation without somebody speaking while they're muted, right? Um, so just to complete our, our technological tour, um, I just wanted to, before I start my presentation, I just wanted to mention that the um, scans that have been done of the peel and the pediment that David just showed, as well as of the building, um, by Direct Dimensions are all available as um, open source data clouds. So if any of you architects or 3D modeling folks out there would be interested in working with those scans, just give us a shout. We'll be happy to provide those data sets to you to study, to build something new, whatever you would like. Um, okay, I'm going to turn off my video now. I'll come back on for the Q&A and just take you through the history now of the renovations of the museum. Um, what, you, what you're seeing now is the museum prior to the uh, renovations, which began in 2017, and then the uh, museum uh, exterior um, after those, the exterior renovations were completed. Um, most, to be honest, of the past four years of renovations of the Peel have been dedicated to fundraising um, and also really as part of that effort to redefining the Peel's purpose for the 21st century and its role in, in Baltimore and the broader cultural economy. Um, so if we go to the next slide you will see um, one of the folks uh, really responsible for starting that effort, Jim Diltz here, who was president of the board of the Peel Center for Baltimore History and Architecture for many years, and along with many other folks for more than a decade, um, really worked very hard with fundraising and lobbying to save the building um, from demolition and to reopen it as an important cultural anchor uh, for the city. Um, the, uh, you might remember uh, in 2017, the building cloaked in scaffolding there. That was while the roof was being replaced. You can see a beautiful shot of our lovely new roof there on the far right. That was provided um, by the Department of General Services of the city of Baltimore. Um, and we had many other benefactors help us with other er aspects of the exterior renovations, including BGE and standing there, in fact, in front of the peel with Jim Diltz is um, Steve Pedry from BGE, who along with a couple of other, other wonderful volun volunteers, Mike Borley and Dave Conrad from Baltimore uh, Foundry Works, renovated the um, historic gas lights, both those in front of the building and the three historic gas lights in the Peel Garden. Um, so really without partners like these, um, unfortunately the building would still be uh, leaking and uh, continuing to decay. Um, so in 2017, the roof was replaced. We also were able to uh, renovate the windows and the doors to stop them from leaking. Um, that work was done by CNH Restoration and Renovation. They did a brilliant job, an award-winning job, in fact. Um, and if we move to the next slide, I'm going to jump us forward in time to phase three, as we call it, of the renovations which began um, in 2021. Now, after Jim Dilt sat 
sadly passed away. Um, the role of really owner's rep or overseer of the renovations of the Peel um, passed to our current board chair, William Chickery, known, Chickering, known to his friends as Chick. Um, and of course, we um, have been very happy to be able to continue to work with the architecture of this phase of renovations, the, the 21st century renovations, Walter Shamu and his team at SM&P. Um, so the two of them have really been holding it together and carrying us forward uh, metaphorically, so to speak. Um, but uh, since I will be channeling them both in this talk, I will start with uh, one of Chick's favorite stories of discoveries in the renovation, which is represented by the photo you see in the top left there of the uh, tie and turnbuckle, which when that um, ceiling was first opened, we initially thought, well, what is this? Is it a gas pipe or something going through the building? It turns out that it is in fact a uh, tie, a metal tie that passes right through the building to hold it together, uh, quite literally. Um, now, in many buildings, you will have seen this kind of thing and the evidence of it on the outside by a plate. Um, and in the center top photo on your screen now, you'll see that uh, plate on the garden side of the building, um, just above a, a group of another group of wonderful volunteers um, who were uh, renovating the garden back in 2018. Among those is Mimi Cooper, after whom our garden is now named. Uh, and thanks for all that she's done to preserve it and frankly, many green spaces and, and other cultural uh, history around the city. Um, but below the, that photo of the group of people in front of the plate that you can see on the back of the building, you see the photo of the facade. If you look over that facade in person or in this photo, you will see no such corresponding plate on the front. Well, that is because in 1930, as David mentioned, the building underwent a really extensive renovation. And if you might recall um, the one of the earlier photos, in fact, if you looked at the facade, it was not brick. Um, early in the 20th century, the, the facade of the building was stuccoed. Well, the 1930s renovation, which really sought within the kind of practices that were typical then to return the building as close as possible to its 1814 state, they removed that stucco. But of course, to put the stucco on, the original brick had been very deeply damaged and scored. Um, so that brick had to be replaced. And they were fortunate that there were some 1820 row houses that were being demolished around the same time that they were renovating the Peel Museum building. And so bricks of the same age as the peel from that demolition were used to uh, re reclothe, as it were, the facade of the peel and therefore covered over that plate um, uh, that is the other end of this tie and turnbuckle system, literally holding the building together. Um, moving to the next slide, there were a couple of other things that we kind of knew were there, but it was nonetheless a great pleasure uh, to see revealed in the interior renovations, which uh, began February of this year. And those were the, um, among those were the original stove niches. Um, now, you again, you might have seen those um, in some of the uh, early black and white photos of the Peel as Municipal Museum building. Those are the Habs photos from the Library of Congress. Um, but we found that we were able to not only uncover them, but tally them with uh, Rembrandt Peel's original uh, inventory of what was in the building. And um, so all of those original stove niches are now uncovered. Um, in the photo on the left, you see uh, the, the grand gallery on the second floor. This is the gallery where we believe um, Rembrandt Peel first demonstrated gaslight technology. Um, and the niches at either end of the room had been covered over. But as you see in the photo on the right, um, we now have uncovered those and those will remain um, kind of visible markers to some of the original architectural features of the building uh, when we reopen uh, early next year. Uh, if we move to the next slide, we can show you some of the um, surprise niches we found. Um, so we didn't know about these, but apparently um, in this room, which some of you might recognize uh, vaguely as having been our time travel agency um, prior to our shutting down for the interior re renovations, um, this wall was, as we understood it, a completely flat wall. But as the renovations proceeded, we discovered that in fact, there were two deep niches on either side of that fire 
fireplace as well. Um, and apparently they were covered over in 1979. So again, we're slowly but surely um, uh, excavating the original kind of footprint of all of the rooms on the interior. Um, in the next slide, we find another very surprising discovery of the renovations up on the third floor in what we call the Garden View Gallery, um, which is in fact the, the room with the two original window casings in it. Um, we found behind some ductwork that was being taken out from a 20th century HVAC system, we found this wallpaper. Um, and I initially said, well, this has to be post 1930s renovation, surely. But it turns out, much to our surprise, as much a surprise as the wallpaper itself, we have a historic wallpaper expert on our team at the Peel. Um, in fact, Heather Shelton, who is otherwise known as our digital curator and registrar, um, wrote her master's degree thesis on 19th century wallpaper. So she did some research on this and discovered that, in fact, it most likely is 19th century wallpaper. Um, she hypothesizes from the period that the Peel was Baltimore City Hall. And if you'd like to read more about her argument uh, in favor of this, this dating of the wallpaper, please visit our website and in the news section you can find her wonderful blog post um, complete with statistics and uh, uh, historical comparisons from the Cooper Hewitt collection. Um, again, we'd love to hear you chime in on this. Um, it is astonishing to me that uh, one would have used this kind of wallpaper in a city hall, but apparently they were very different concepts of what a public space should look like back then. So um, we will be preserving um, this wallpaper beyond, uh, you know, through, through our interior renovations, and there'll be a viewing panel so you'll be able to see it when you come visit early next year. Um, in the next slide, I want to move to things that were not at all surprises, but absolutely really the motivation for shutting down for this interior phase of renovations, which is making the work that we're doing to make the building accessible and safe for everyone. Um, primary among those major infrastructure changes was the installation of an elevator. So although this building was used as a museum up until 1997, when the um, municipal Museum was shut down and the collection was transferred over to um, uh, the Maryland Historical Society as it was then known. Um, even that late in the 20th century, this building had no elevator. So it was basically inaccessible to anyone who couldn't climb three flights of stairs. Um, so we're finally able to put an elevator in. Um, you can see the shaft fully formed there. We're waiting, expecting the delivery of the elevator itself at the end of October. It's a very small one, um, what's called a Lula uh, or a single use, uh, two, essentially two people can ride in it at a time. Um, but it will have an accessible entrance from Watch House Alley. Uh, you can see that uh, entrance kind of marked in the photo in the top right here with demo um, on, that, on, on the door there to the exterior. Um, and you will enter that space uh, from the inside of the lobby uh, at the foot of the stairs. Also in that space, if we move to the next slide, um, we'll see that there are going to be two uh, single use, fully accessible restrooms alongside the elevator lobby, um, replacing the um, restrooms, the two restrooms that were there of a very dubious um, functionality. If any of you happen to use those restrooms in the Peel Museum building before we shut down for interior renovations, I'm sure you'll be relieved to know that not only are they being replaced with really wonderfully accessible and modern uh, facilities, but actually more than doubled. There will now be uh, twice as more than twice as many restrooms in the building, um, including a fully accessible restroom on every floor, um, excluding the, the attic and the basement. Um, there will also be, if we move to the next uh, slide, there'll be a, another, so a third accessible restroom on the ground floor, just off what we're now calling the Moses Williams Center. Now you'll recall, David talked about M Moses Williams, the uh, young black artist and entrepreneur who was part of the Peel uh, family until he set out on his own with his own silhouette cutting business uh, based in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, we've named this center after him because it will 
will house the teaching gallery for the Peel's apprenticeship program, um, which will offer training in the historic preservation trades and uh, art handling, gallery installation, and gallery preparation um, under the leadership of our chief curator, Jeffrey Kent. Um, the room, the, the, the two smaller photos that you see uh, just above the title here uh, show you in the center photo, this room originally it was actually um, divided, a much larger room divided in half during the 1930s renovations. And you can probably make out on the left hand wall of that photo, uh, it's kind of marked with some uh, dotted line paint and arrows on it. That part of the wall has now been cut out and that's what you see in the photo on the right, this large opening that's been created so that the room is now an L shape. Um, and in the, uh, that L part that we can see in the photo at the right will be a catering facility. So in this space, you will be able to um, see works installed by our apprentices. They will hold their classrooms. There will also be uh, catering facilities for them and for events and two openings onto the Peel Garden. So there'll be a really lovely flow through from the building um, into that, that gorgeous uh, back garden. Uh, for, for all of our visitors. Um, and uh, if we move on to the next space, the next slide, sorry, you'll see again the silhouette of Moses Williams and a photo of the first cohort of apprentices who helped us really prototype this program last summer, again, under um, uh, Je Jeffrey Kent's mentorship. He's standing there at the left. All right, moving along to the next slide, I'll show you. So these entrances um, from the garden into the Moses Williams Center, uh, you can see one of them in the photo at right back, there's a, a sifting uh, stand and a gentleman against the wall there. There'll be an entrance through there as well as run around the corner. Um, and what you see here is um, a new staircase that has been installed from that back garden in between those two entrances that will create a third entrance into the building at the second story level into what has been known as the picture gallery or now called the Latrobe Room um, in honor of Benjamin Latrobe and all of his many contributions to uh, Baltimore as well as the nation's architecture and cultural heritage. Before those staircases were uh, installed, which was early in 2020, um, uh, Jim Gibbs conducted an archaeological dig uh, where the footings were going to be just to make sure we wouldn't be disturbing anything of any uh, archaeological importance. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, I suppose the uh, garden has been dug up so many times during the various renovations and phases of the building's history that there really wasn't anything of any archaeological significance found uh, in the garden, but that did allow us to put in the staircase. Uh, there. And so that will allow you from the garden to come into the picture gallery. And if we go to the next slide or from the picture gallery, the trobe room, um, go out into directly into the garden. Now that work, including the creation of the doorway and the uh, removal of the 1980s stage that was in this room um, was made possible uh, with a grant from Preservation Maryland um, and uh, also support from a lot of individual donors. And um, now what we're working on is the uh, reparation of the uh, plaster and repainting, um, just the general renovation of the room. And perhaps most importantly in this gorgeous room, which has extremely high ceilings and the skylight, which really makes this the room that makes the building architecturally unique, um, we're working on uh, installing modern lighting. So if we go to the next slide, I'll. And you might, if you again visited any programs in the Peel between 2017 or even 2016, um, and when we began the uh, renovations of the interior, uh, uh, where we shut down for the renovations at the end of 2019, um, you might recall that the lighting in the building was very sparse, very antiquated, uh, kind of this 1970s track lighting you see in the photo on the right the store of 
uh, almost antique bulbs and heads that we jealously guarded because when something went out, you, we couldn't buy a replacement. We had to go to this, what had been left behind when the building was shut down in 97 to, uh, to try to light the rooms up. Um, we even resorted, as, as again, David mentioned, to um, installing an, a, a ring of fire um, in the spirit of Rembrandt Peel. This is, of course, designed after the one that was in the, uh, the 1930s uh, engraving that you saw um, of Rembrandt Peel demonstrating the gaslighting, the, the, the magic ring of fire and the gaslight chandelier that he used in his museum. This one was actually built for us by, again, Steve Pedry, whom you saw at the beginning of my presentation, and the other volunteers uh, from BGE and Baltimore Foundry Works um, as really just a way to tell that part of the Peel's history. But um, it also played a role in lighting the picture gallery during events at, at various times, like this one uh, performance by uh, Afro House. Anyway, we need to move beyond 1970s lighting as we uh, finalize the renovations of the building and get ready to reopen. So this is our next big campaign is uh, bringing light back to the peel, um, which is in so many ways the uh, at the origins of uh, many modern concepts and modern technologies of lighting in the city of Baltimore, and in fact uh, gave rise to the name, the nickname of of Baltimore as Light City, uh, thanks to Rembrandt Peel introducing gaslight to the city. So, um, if you'd like to help us relight the Peel with more modern lighting, um, we will. You'll be hearing from us um, next week, actually, about our campaign to get sponsorships for spotlights and uh, uh, lenses and floodlights and various things. And we sure would appreciate your help getting safe and modern lighting into re-illuminating this important landmark. Um, the last, but by no means the least major infrastructure piece that we're working on during our renovations um, that, uh, again, was really an important reason to shut down the building to renovate it, was to bring in new HVAC. Uh, again, if you've been in the building prior to our interior renovations, you might have heard or even seen the behemoth of, a, of a, an early 20th century um, HVAC system, heating and cooling system, rumbling away in the basement like a dragon. That's all gone now and we've also been able to remove from the roof the uh, cooling tower. You see that being removed in the photo at the left here um, so that we could install a much more efficient and compact um, HVA system in the attic and you see it going in at the right there. Um, and again we're very grateful for the help of a grant from the Maryland Energy Authority uh, to help us do that to really bring the building up to code. Um, so those are really the major infrastructure uh, and interior renovation uh, efforts that are underway, again, to be completed by the end of this year with um, reopening uh, in March of 2022. And um, I will just um, conclude with this final image. Um, and a quiz. If you've ever taken one of my tours of the inside of the Peel building, you know I like to include pop quizzes. Um, the question of the day is, what is this Chicago watch clock station? And if you subscribe to the Peel's mailing list, you will have gotten the answer to this question in this week's newsletter. Um, if you are not subscribed, you can sign up at any time um, through our website or just shoot us an e email and we'll be happy to sign you up. We get lots of wonderful little uh, tidbits like this with the help of, again, Chick William Chickering, our board chair and owner's rep, our architectures team, and um, our historian and historians in residence, Dean Krimmel and um, Heather Shelton. So, so um, anybody who'd like to venture a guess as to what this is in the q and I'll be happy to uh, tell you whether you're right or wrong and come back to it um, and answer any other questions that you have as well. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, talk about what the Peel is today before we head over to questions. I know we're, we're uh, coming up on time, so I'm going to move rather quickly. Uh, today and moving into the future, the Peel is a center for Baltimore stories. And um, our collection uh, is not of physical objects. It is born digital, and we stored the largest collection 
uh, the largest archive of digitally collected Baltimore stories in the world. We have over 1,600 stories so far and uh, add more on a weekly um, basis. And so we focus on the intangible cultural history of the city. Again, we don't collect objects, we collect stories. But in thinking of ourselves as a center for Baltimore stories, we also have a broad definition of story. So this could be an oral history or a traditional definition of story, but we also look at the stories that are told through paintings or performances or anything else that anybody comes to us and wants to be able to share. And with that in mind, I would like to say if any of you have any ideas for things you would like to share at the Peel, we would love to hear and support and help you share your story. So please feel free to be in touch with us. We also look at ourselves as a museum laboratory. We experiment with things and try things as well as a teaching museum, not just through our AAA program, but through uh, our ongoing efforts efforts um, to experiment with just what museum practice is in the 21st century. I also wanted to mention really quickly before we move on that during the pandemic in August of last year, uh, April uh, 2020, we did open up a virtual peel in the virtual world known as Second Life. Uh, just a few months ago, we celebrated our one year uh, birthday of the virtual peel uh, while celebrating our 207th birthday of the physical peel. And uh, you can visit our website for more information on visiting the virtual peel. And since the peel has been shut down for renovation, and we've been operating out of the historic Carroll Mansion, which is located uh, less than a mile from the Peel on President Street, built uh, around 1815, around the same time as the uh, Peel Museum. We've continued to host a variety of uh, exhibition and performances and programmings at Carroll Mansion. And in fact, our next exhibition will open up um, in now just uh, eight days on October 22nd, known as The Guardians. This is a photographic and story telling exhibition that will take place not only at Carroll Mansion, but also um, will have uh, large photographic banners hung throughout the city, including on City Hall. So keep your eyes peeled for that. The exhibition opens on October 22nd with a opening reception on Saturday, November fourth, I believe, could be the fifth. Lastly, we've mentioned a few times that we hope that you uh, get in contact with us. And so for more information, you can visit us online at thepeelcenter.org. While you're there, also take um, the opportunity to visit us in Second Life. Check out our variety of other uh, 3D and virtual tours that we have to go even more in depth on the subjects that we've talked about today, as well as to sign up for our newsletter so that you can stay connected. I think we got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to um, turn my my uh, camera back on and um, and we will go to the chat for um, any questions. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Nancy and, and David. It's, it's just so incredible to see what you've done with the Peel. Um, it's, I, I remember uh, like since we started Doors Open in 2014, we've included the Peel as part of our program. And it's just been incredible to see the transformation of both the capital project to renovate the building and also does the transformation in the in the vision of the museum itself and its and its goals. Um, so really great presentation. And Nancy, I, I see that you've already answered a few of the questions um, in the QA box. Um, uh, I also posted in the in the QA box uh, the YouTube channel where we'll be posting the recording of this as well. Um, but I wanted to revisit um, one of the questions that you um, that you answered, which was about um, if slaves uh, were involved in the building of of the museum. And you mentioned that you're working on a grant application um, to learn more about the laborers who worked at the Peel. Could you say a little bit more about about that um, research project? Yeah. Um... So I was just adding one last quick answer in the chat there. Um, yeah, so this is a question that's been kind of burning for us really since we started the renovations. I mean, we knew who commissioned the building, we knew who the architect was, but we knew nothing about who physically built the building. Um, and it's a really interesting question, not least because of all of the kind of shipbuilding and other construction trades that were really thriving in Baltimore around 1814, and the fact that Baltimore had both an enslaved and a very large free Black population. So we really want to get to the bottom of that. I think it's a very important 
point to connect also back forward to um, the Peel's role and history as male and female colored school number one to you know really what was the role that it played um, particularly in the lives of the African American populations um, in the city. So um, we actually, thanks to Krista Green, our chief administrative officer, we just found out about a fund that has become available to help organizations like ours investigate precisely these kinds of histories of their past. And we, we were very fortunate. We were supported by a grant from Maryland Heritage Areas Authority early on to work with historians to research the history of the colored school at the Peel. And so what we're looking for is something very similar to that where we go find, you know, who are the experts in labor history and Baltimore history of this period who can really help us um, get to some good answers. And that will obviously then be featured in the building as one of our core stories and, um, uh, and on exhibition um, in various ways uh, throughout the building as well as our online spaces. Thank Great. you, Nancy. I, know that, I noticed that you um, answered a question in the Q&A box, but I just wanted to voice the question and the answer because I forgot to say it, which is when will the Peel renovations be complete and when will we move back in so that everyone can hear if you're not looking at the Q&A. Uh, renovations will be complete at the end of this year um, and we'll start uh, moving in early 2022. And we are currently planning our first exhibitions for the fully renovated building uh, for March of 2022. So we are less than six months away from reopening to the public at this point. Okay. Are, are you planning it like a, a celebration for the reopening? Yeah, but um, we're going to bring back a practice that I learned from my, and, and while I was working at the Smithsonian, used to be standard in museums, and then somehow around the 1960s was done away with, which is the idea of soft launching exhibitions and soft launching openings of things, which I think makes so much sense. Um, so I would consider our March reopening kind of a soft launch. Um, I mean, the exhibitions will be very fully formed and real, but the garden won't yet be fully renovated, for example. And um, we really want to, as we do with all of our programming as well, work with the community, have people come in, the signage will be deliberately temporary, so that as we figure out where our wayfinding and our signage isn't quite working, we can make the fixes before we, you know, spend uh, and install the, the permanent signage, etc. So I think that and the lighting and all of these kinds of um, details, as it were, around um, accessibility and use of the building uh, will continue to be refined throughout 2022, but we do expect everything to be completely finished by the end of 2022. And um, so along, I'm, I think, you know, don't hold me to this, Nathan, but I think if we do a great big grand celebration the most appropriate date for that would, of course, be August 15th of 2022 on the, Peel's, the Peel Museum building's birthday. That'll, that'll be so fun. I'm really looking forward to returning to the Peel and, and seeing the renovation um, complete in person. Uh, someone asked here, uh, what will happen to the Carroll Mansion after you move out? And the Carroll Mansion is itself its own museum. Yeah, and Jim Durkee, who's the director of Carroll Museums, is part of this, so we should really uh, hand over to him, but I guess since that's not possible to do in audio, <laughs> although Jim, feel free to, to, chat, to chat as much as you like via text. Um, I mean, it, the Carroll Museums um, have always been and will continue to be, I'm sure, uh, open for visits, um, including the Shot Tower. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope to continue collaborating with um, the Carroll Mansion and with Jim and, and his team. It's been a really wonderful home away from home and a great space which many artists and other uh, community partners have enjoyed using as a, as a, as a base and an exhibition center. So, um, you know, hopefully that relationship now that it's forged will, will continue to thrive and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to see great stuff happening at Carroll Mansion. And I see that Jim has has made it into video. So Jim, if you want to comment further on that, we'd love to hear your voice. Uh, well, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that we have much the same problem uh, that Nancy has, which is it doesn't appear to be any record as to when the Carroll Mansion was built. All we know is when somebody famous bought it. <laughs> and that person was not Charles Carroll. That was Richard Caton, uh, Catonsville. Uh, he had married uh, uh, Charles Carroll's oldest daughter, somewhat against dad's wishes, but he 
He made it clear in correspondence that he did not believe he could actually interfere if his daughter chose a husband and really, really wanted to spend the rest of her life with that person. So they had uh, quite a few children, by the way, the Caton sisters. They were famous in Baltimore history, but he uh, retired there and lived there and that's where he died. Uh, but uh, I have been getting questions from people who want to visit the Carroll Mansion and I have to explain to them that there are four Carroll mansions in Baltimore that were lived in by Charles Carroll. And all of them are different Charles Carrolls. One of them was actually a Protestant. Okay, so which one do you want to go to? But we're, we're around and we're more than happy to host the Peel and we ourselves benefit from the technology that they're working on. We have a good HVAC system in practice, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is we need some work on the roof too. You know, it's, it's, it's an old building. Might not know exactly how old, but it's an old building. And uh, we're more than happy to host them for as long as they wish to stay. Thank you, Jim. And for anyone who's interested in, vis in visiting Carroll Mansion, it is open every Saturday and Sunday from noon to 4 p.m. You are welcome to go anytime, although once again, it would be great if you uh, visit us from October 22nd onward to check out the Peel's latest exhibition, The Guardians, which will open on that day and be on display until December. Uh, I think we were at time. Uh, so thank you, Nancy. And, and David for this really great presentation. Um, and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel probably later this week. Um, and please go to www.doorsopenbaltimore.org to see our upcoming programs. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, bye-bye.